Nothing but a normal day in a rice field. The crops seem to look healthy and in good shape, especially this eggplant right here that is outshining all the others. Now comes the story of our protagonist, Jin Mita, who quit his job as an office worker four years ago and moved to a small town deep in the countryside. Less than 30,000 people live in this peaceful countryside, making life feel wonderful for Jin. He checks his crops and is quite happy with the output. He knows the time is quite near to harvest them. With that, he checks on the patties and sees their progress as well. Little does he know of what surprise awaits him there. He reaches the patties and something shiny meets his eyes, making him fear that maybe an item has fallen which could ruin his patties. Jin races towards the shiny item, praying to God it isn't something too damaging for his babies, which are his crops. However, he is frozen on the spot by seeing a female knight lying unconscious in his paddles. God really has sent down the best present for our corporate farmer. Jin isn't too happy to see her lying on his patties and is assuming that she is some anime cosplayer who just wants a photo shoot in his patties. He makes an effort to wake her up, which is when she gently opens up her eyes and looks at him, trying her best to remember where she is. Jin, on the other hand, is taken aback by her beauty, her white skin, blonde hair, and transparent emerald eyes. This moment looks more real than any fictional book he has ever read. He asks her who she is and if she can understand what he's trying to say to her. Abruptly, she gets up and smacks his face, ordering oh. him to stay away from her. Well, this didn't go as planned. She looks around confused, a bit scared, but bold enough to ask him who he is and where the heck she is. Guess the dialogues have been reversed over here. Clearly annoyed but keeping his composure, Jin explains how she is in modern day Japan and is on his farm, more importantly, lying on his patties. She still has no idea of what monstrosity she has committed and is still clueless of where she has been transported. Jin is in no mood for outer space drama and tells her to be careful before getting up to leave. She does have the decency to introduce herself as Seraphim Steadfeld, the eldest daughter from a family of knights who served the kingdom of Laphoria. Well, that went over Jin's head, because he has never heard of such a place. Guess Seraphim is on some wacky Dungeons & Dragons game. He tells her that he doesn't know of any such place, and if she's trying to continue the anime act, then it isn't funny, since the elder farmers wouldn't like this at all. Seraphim doesn't take his joke lightly, and tells him how the knights would protect farmers like him, and he is only mocking her. She shall not tolerate such transgressions, and out comes her sharp sword, which she is about to use on him, but her body gives way. Fatigue and exhaustion weigh heavily on this knight's body, and she recalls the battles she has fought in her other world. For once, she wishes to rest and not fight. In this way, Seraphim falls unconscious back in the patties that our vulnerable farmer has been trying to protect. She wakes a few minutes later, and is astonished to see the farmer carrying her all the way to his house. This task of carrying her wasn't easy, and we can see that on Jen's face. She gets off and jumps over a high wall to see his house. That must have been some power nap. Jin is still not sure if she's from another world or some really overdeveloped cosplayer. Seraphim is astounded to see such a large house owned by a mere farmer. Well, it is modern day Japan and you can't expect farmers to still live in a tent. The two enter the house and well, Seraphim is even more fascinated by the interior design the way everything has been arranged in this new world. Jin is more concerned on the matters which involve the water that seems to be squeezing out of her knight's armor and ruining his well-polished floor. He tells her to leave her shoes and even her armor outside since it's messing his house up. Our man ain't a simp, and he isn't going to let some hot blondie ruin his wooden tiles. She comes back inside without the armor and is looking very pretty indeed. Wearing pretty simple clothes, but if she never planned on becoming a model for Victoria's Secret, that option would suit her as well. Despite her taking the armor off, the stockings are soaking wet and filled with gunk. Jin tells her to take a bath and get herself clean since she did fall twice in his patties. He does clear his statement out, telling her that he doesn't mean it in a pervy way, he must have remembered that slap which he got earlier. Seraphim isn't too phased by the bath option, but is actually surprised the house even has a bath. He shows her the bathroom and the excitement from her is pretty evident. Jin switches the water system on and lets the water spout inside the bathtub. He then turns the system on for hot water so she could have a relaxing bath. All this seems like Seraphim has entered the future, where even farmers are equipped with the latest technology. She eyes the shower lever and presses it, hoping to know what it does, but is instead all covered with water. She falls back on her butt and sits cluelessly as the water soaks her wet. This has started to get more and more interesting. Jin, being our Sigma male, switches the tap off, annoyed over her carelessness, but he can see her feeling sad over not having the knowledge about all of these things. She asks him to teach her how to use the appliances, which he does before leaving her to undress. She also asks for him to call her Sarah from now on. Guess the two have started getting pretty frank and comfortable. 
Jin leaves to find her some dry clothes for her to wear after the shower. While we get to relax our eyes with this wonderful view of Sarah getting naked and cleaning her body up a bit with the shower head before finally getting into the hot bath. A bit of fan service isn't that bad, right? We now come back to Jin, who is a 29 year old bachelor. He lives alone in a lavish farmhouse and hasn't had a girlfriend for quite some time now. He takes out one of his old high school jerseys which has grown too small for him. He keeps this in mind that Sarah has a thin figure so this jersey would be comfortable for her. He carries the clothes and towel towards the bathroom to hand it to her but turns out Sarah has completed her shower and comes out as well. Completely naked. Jin gets a nice long view of her before turning away at once and with her shutting the door on him. He wholeheartedly apologizes to her for this error and leaves the dry clothes and towel for her to take before she leaves. She accepts his apology, telling him that she knows that he has no bad intentions and that they should forget this ever happened. Jin sits in the living room waiting for her, before she arrives wearing his tracksuit and boy oh boy does it go perfectly well on her. He is happy that it is comfortable for her but his eyes fall on her chest and this makes him look away once again. She isn't wearing a bra underneath so this makes a certain part protrude a bit out more. Nonetheless, he can't do much in this area and asks if she would like to eat something. The rumbling sound in her stomach speaks volumes at that moment and so our protagonist cooks up something delicious. The smell alone makes her mouth water and once it is served she can't hold back but since she doesn't know how to use chopsticks he gets her a spoon and fork to make it easier to eat. Jin is still a bit curious over how the seraphim girl knows the Japanese language but not the culture. It really is strange. Jin and Sarah are now seated opposite to each other and are ready to gobble down what he has cooked up. Before they start, Jin joins his hands together to pray, which Sarah doesn't understand why he's doing this, to which he explains how it's sort of like a pre-meal ritual. She does it too, and makes this moment super kawaii. Jin, in his mind, thinks how anything can stand out if it's a beautiful girl doing it. Now, now Jin, don't fall into the trap. Sarah picks up the rice bowl and with puppy dog eyes asks him what these white things are, to which he explains how they're rice which he got from the paddy fields that she has fallen into. She smells them before taking a bite of it and the wonderful scrumptious taste takes her galaxies away, to the point where tears cascade down her rosy red cheeks. He advises her to try it with some other side dishes to give some taste, and she does so. The combination to different side dishes has our female knight running riot all over the dinner table. A bite here, a bite there, and a bite everywhere. Enjoying herself would actually be an understatement. She's actually feeling the food inside of her, all the way from her mouth to her insides. We better stop, otherwise this would turn into something other than a manga. Next on the menu is miso soup, which is yet again another winner for our female knight, and she compliments Jin's cooking skills in this area as well. While the two feast down, Jin is feeling nostalgic. He hasn't had such a wonderful feeling in quite some time now. He has been living all day in his huge house, but having a visitor and eating with them makes him feel really special. Dinner is over, and now we come down to more pressing matters, which is Sarah asking Jin what his name is. Wow, they've had a whole meal together, yet she doesn't even know his name. She apologizes for being so late and asking him about his name, but he reassures her that it is quite fine and introduces himself as Jin Mita. She calls his entire name without any space, making him feel pretty weird. Alas, after a bit of an explanation, she understands that the people in this world have two different names. One is a surname and one in which you can call as the first. Jin is still confused why she continues to act as a girl who doesn't know what is happening and asks her when she plans to cut the act which makes her burst at him. She tells him that she isn't acting and she really is a knight, but the tension dies fast when he tells her that there is rice stuck on her face. She gets distracted and starts cleaning that up. He then asks her where she's even from again, to which she tells him how she was in a forest in the siege rotation of the Laforia kingdom. But before she can continue any further, he reminds her that there is still some rice stuck on her face. Give her a break already, Jin. Deep in the forest of the Zij region haunts the hideous creature that mankind could only imagine. Standing in the middle of these hideous creatures is Sarah and her squadron, who looks very beaten up and unable to defend against these growing beasts and monsters. Sarah isn't tired and is ready to give it her all to save her people, but she is disturbed by the information that she has received. They were ill-informed about the total enemies and more alarmingly, they were singled out from the army on purpose. Maybe this was someone's plan after all. Sarah isn't scared at all and plunges towards the trolls, slicing his face in half. One of the squadron members shouts at her in fear of losing her to this army, but she tells him to retreat and regroup with the others while she deals with these vicious monsters. Split from the group, Sarah drags the monsters towards her like bait for a fish, killing as many as she possibly can. She fights without rest, throughout the night, expanding all her physical and mental energy. With all of the monsters now killed, Sarah could feel her body give way and thus pass out, only to be woken up by a farmer boy named Jen Mita. 
Which brings us back to the present day Japan, and Sarah has finished her story of how her previous life was before she saw his face. Jin still hasn't gotten a clear understanding of the situation, and neither has Sarah, who doesn't know how she got transported into this strange world where farmers are equipped with the latest bathroom technology. Jin explains to her how this kingdom of hers doesn't exist in this world, and neither does the Zij Palace. There also aren't any monsters or demons which she should magically find in the forest. Sarah doesn't believe him, since she clearly remembers each and every detail that transpired before she got transported here. All at once, she is hit with the realization that she must regroup with her squadron and confirm their safety, after which she shall report to the kingdom ASAP. Jin stares at her with suspecting glares, and then withdraws his phone to show her a map of the world. This proves his point that there is no such thing as monsters or any palace either. Having grabbed enough information for now, Sarah gets up, changes back to her knight's armor, and she looks back and tells him that she shall return the kind and nice favor he had bestowed upon her one day. Jin tries to stop her, but she has her mind made up to return back to the kingdom at all costs, and reunite with her comrades and request reinforcements. This is getting pretty annoying for Jin. Why would anyone go to this length to think that they're still in some fictitious manga or anime show? Sarah doesn't hear a single word from his mouth. She charges out of the house and with full speed tries to leave the village. She looks back one last time and thanks him for everything, even calling him Sir Jin. There is no point now to dwell on the past with some nutty anime cosplaying girl who thinks she has to save some kingdom. He has more pressing matters to attend to, which he realizes once his eyes fall on the clock in the living room. It is 2.30 p.m and he was supposed to deliver the goods by four. Our protagonist is in some big problems if he doesn't make it on time. And with that, the entire house is in chaos as he sets up everything to leave. With the crazy night lady who wishes to fight some demons or whatever as now gone, Jin gets back into the field to collect the harvest and pack it up and take it to the marketplace. He is already very late. He is glad that she's gone and he can continue with his boring and very simple life of farming. While plucking the vegetables, he notices a cucumber and thinks to himself how it looks very similar to the sword that Sarah pulled out to kill him. How could a cucumber look similar to a sword? Out of all the things he could possibly imagine, why a cucumber? This fool has lost his mind. He manages to reach the marketplace and apologizes with a low bow to the manager for being so late with the deliveries. The manager doesn't complain and thanks him for bringing it. While driving back home, he thinks to himself how it's 7 p.m., and his luck is good today to get out of a sticky situation. Nonetheless, he managed to do it all, and now he feels like he deserves some type of treat. Some beer and even a salmon would taste really good tonight, as a celebration for all that went down today. He daydreams about all these little goodies until he accidentally almost hits someone right in front of him. Guess his luck is slowly running out now. Slapping himself back into reality, he apologizes to the person he has hit with the car, but recognizes this person as Sarah. She doesn't look back or notice anything at all. The poor knight stares blankly right in front of her. It seems as if she's lost all meaning of life and looks quite lost. Jin gets out of the truck and approaches her, asking in a polite tone what she's doing here. She looks at him hurt and frightened, and you can see the pain right through her eyes. She tells him how she looked everywhere for the forest in her home, but nothing came up. To make matters worse, she even interviewed the townspeople, but they were as clueless as her. Jin can sense that Sarah is heartbroken. Earlier that day, she had bombarded him with a multitude of questions, but now she's very quiet and reserved. He feels sympathetic for her at this point. He tells her that she might have come from a different world, even now he feels like she's lying. She looks back at him, tears welling in her beautiful eyes, and she tells him that she isn't lying. At this point, even Jin can sense the fear in her words. She really is lost and has been transported from another world to his. She thanks him for believing in her, since his support is enough to give her strength in this very desperate time. The two stand quietly, a feeling of gloominess between them. He tells her that the fields become pitch black in a few minutes and they should return back to his place for the night. She accepts the invitation with a tired smile and sits in the back of a pickup truck as they make their way home from the farmhouse. While they slowly drive back, Sarah watches the round orb of the moon from the night sky, hoping in her heart that this is all a dream and she would wake up back in her own world. By the time they arrived back at his house, Sarah had calmed down a bit, but she was too exhausted to talk more and wished to sleep. Jin tries to imagine what it would be like to wake up in a completely different world so he could put himself in her shoes. For starters, he knows he would start crying, but he knows that Sarah is tougher than that. He takes a glass of water to her room quietly, but stops when he hears a sobbing sound coming from inside. He knows he mustn't disturb her in the situation and leaves the glass outside. Coming into the kitchen, he arranges all the food items for the next day, while remembering the way he and Sarah had perfectly vibed while having lunch. He wants to see her smile again and just get out of the depression that she has sunk into. 
With a smile, he comes up with the idea to help her restore her life points with a Japanese-style breakfast in the morning. Sarah wakes up looking dazed and confused, not really sure if he had fallen asleep. Waking up in another world feels like a dream, until the reality hits her and she realizes that she's actually a very long way from home. Well, there's certainly no point in worrying over something she can't control. Therefore, she decides to focus on something she can actually do. Going over to the window, she looks around her beautiful surroundings until she smells something quite delicious. The amazing aroma takes her straight to the kitchen where Jin is preparing breakfast with his focus entirely on the ingredients in front of him. Wishing him good morning, she catches him off guard because it's been a long time since there was someone in the house to greet him. She politely thanks him for bringing her the water in the night when she was sobbing alone. Finally understanding that this is where the tasty smell was coming from. She offers to lend a helping hand, but the considerate farmer just asks her to do the minimal work of bringing the ingredients tray a bit closer to him. Jin shifts his focus right back to the rice because it's the best thing to have in the morning. Next up is miso soup as he starts cutting the onions, adding his finishing touch by sprinkling them on top. The meal he has prepared looks straight out of a picture because it looks mouth-watering and he's pleased with himself when he notices the cheerful expression on Sarah's face. It's clear that his plan has worked since nothing is better than a freshly cooked feast at the start of the day. She begins eating, immediately complimenting the delicious fruit that fills her mouth after biting. It turns out that she's talking about the tomatoes, and she has no idea that it's actually a vegetable. This is surely the first time that she's eating such delicious vegetables. Therefore, she sings Jin's praises for growing a fine produce on his farm. For now, Jin doesn't take her compliment seriously, as he is aware that this food is different from her world's meals, while she focuses on the aromatic fish. She has never eaten a fish with so much fat on it, which is why she's enjoying herself without a care in the world. Sarah has self-declared that she will never get tired of the miso soup because the taste is just so incredible. Jin informs her that the fish is called a salmon, reminding her of the fish called a donko that is found in her own world. Apparently, they had this really dirty, fishy smell that was hard to get rid of, and now they didn't even taste good. Jin can understand how unappetizing it might have been for her, but it looks like he still wants to try it. He's such a foodie. Suddenly, he watches her expressions changing as she lets him know that she's feeling ashamed for making a mess of the fish. Thankfully, Jin is a reasonable guy who smiles at her, completely conscious of the fact that it might be hard for her to eat with a fork. It was a good decision to not let her try chopsticks right away, correct? Sarah is still freaking out about the fact that you can't even slice fish properly, feeling like a failure as a knight. In order to make her feel better, Jin agrees that it's not the easiest dish to eat with a fork and asks her to pass her plate over to him. He picks up his own chopsticks to divide the fish into parts so it's easier for her to eat, but it looks like something else has caught her interest now. She is still staring at the chopsticks when Jin asks if she wants to give them a try, making her agree to this new experiment immediately. Before she can dive into it though, he asks her to make bang bang fingers, which surprises her because she has never heard such a strange chant before. The farmer explains that this is exactly how he was taught to use chopsticks back in kindergarten, but it's the first time this little trick has come in handy. She follows his actions, while he asks her to prop the chopsticks against her fingers and grab them. It will obviously take some time for her to learn because this process is still hard for her, making Jin smile after he instructs her to give it a try with the cucumbers since fish is still harder to grab. After trying for a little while, Sarah finally gets the hang of it as she gets excited when she manages to grab a cucumber with the chopsticks. Hopefully she will have plenty of chances in the future, and soon enough, she will be eating with chopsticks like a professional. That being said, Jin actually holds back his laughter because it has been really funny watching her try to use chopsticks. However, Sarah clearly looks worried as he works out that she's feeling disturbed about returning back to her world. At this point, he inquires if there's any way for her to return home, which makes her think before replying that she doesn't know if it's actually possible for her to return. At first, she thought that she might be able to find mana residue or a magic circle. However, she can't find any trace of them on Jin's field when she woke up. Confusion strikes Jin because he has never heard such weird words before, but he can understand her anxiety since she has been unable to find any clues until now. Not to worry though, Sarah has made up her mind to not be a burden on anyone expressing that she plans to find a way to survive in this new world on her own. First off, the knight believes that she is a skilled combatant, so it shouldn't be a big problem for her to make some money. Maybe she can try her skills on the monsters or orcs roaming around this world until her future plans are ruined by Jin informing her that there are no monsters in this world. Plus, the job classification of a knight doesn't even exist, so she might have to update her resume. Sarah has definitely gotten the biggest shock of her life, feeling utterly confused about what lies ahead for her. Her disappointment doesn't last for long though, as she declares that she will make money somehow because she is quite strong. Moreover, there should be some sort of labor that requires physical strength, right? 
Her words are enough to get Jin's agreement on her physical strength. However, he is also practical and recognizes that it will be hard for her to find a proper job because she doesn't have any ID card or a home. Only the underground world will be ready to offer her a job, but she is too beautiful to work with the likes of criminals. While he is still thinking about her prospects, Sarah gets up to leave after thanking him for his efforts, even though she shouldn't have been making such snap decisions. She continues to tell him that she will be finding some mages to figure out a way for her to return, promising to repay him for being so kind to her. Jin is completely speechless at her words, noticing that she has fallen to the dark side because she's willing to let things happen as they will. This is definitely the bad end route. Before she can step out completely though, Jin offers her to live with him without even realizing what exactly has come out of his mouth. Sarah stops in her tracks while Jin continues to let her know that he won't be able to pay her that much even though she will have to do a lot of exhausting work, but he is willing to let her stay with him. Sarah immediately agrees to his offer, as she only needs a place to sleep and food to eat, giving a new start to the professional relationship. This is how Jin begins living with Sarah, and he starts off by explaining all the work which is really tough. Despite everything, the excited knight is thrilled about starting her journey working in this world. However, they will have to see if she can manage all of this manual labor. Three days later, Sarah is ready to work, and Jin takes her straight to the field where she expresses that as her first time working like this, promising to be the best employee ever. However, she is carrying her sword as well, which is otherworldly for Jin, but he doesn't have the heart to stop her because she feels restless without her precious weapon. Of course, he dictates the Japanese law on swords and firearms to her, which doesn't allow anyone to carry such long blades unless it's absolutely required by the job, asking her to keep it in mind. These laws are quite absurd for Sarah, because this law indicates that even knives must be illegal, but it's clear that she doesn't understand that this world is peaceful. Putting her at ease, he lets her carry the sword because nobody will believe that it's real anyway, so it should be fine as long as she doesn't unsheath it the moment she gets a bit angry. Moving on, the long day of work begins, as their first order of business is to harvest the long eggplants. They enter the greenhouse which fascinates Sarah because she has never seen so many eggplants in one place. Jin also educates her about the uses of the vinyl greenhouse, stating that it helps them to control how much the outside environment affects what they grow. The bottom line is that it makes it much easier for them to grow plants, making Sarah declare that farming in this world is too advanced. Jin can understand her excitement as the place she comes from is somewhat similar to the Middle Ages in Europe, which has developed alongside magic. She notices an eggplant which is unnaturally long, Therefore, Jin starts a lesson about the length of these eggplants. Even Sarah has noticed that he becomes really talkative when it comes to vegetables, suggesting that it would be better if his usual expression was as relaxed as he is when he talks about his obsession. Jin can't believe that she is actually trying to call him stone-faced, and he feels that it's completely different from when she talks about her sword. This is when Sarah gets delighted to see a new tool, which is a trolley that moves just by pushing it. Her cluelessness is too cute. Stopping her from playing around, Jin gets to the point by explaining that she can use the scissors to gauge whether the eggplant is of the appropriate size to be harvested. He asks her to give it a shot, and she finally cuts it when Jin cries out in surprise. At first, Sarah thinks that she messed up on her first day, feeling terrible about hurting his precious produce. Fortunately, Jin just gives her a smile to let her know that she did just fine. It turns out that he was just trying to help her relax, which didn't work out because Sarah's sword is out again. Well, she puts her sword away and they continue working. However, Sarah really starts to watch Jin working. He works so fast that it's hard to keep up with his speed, and it doesn't make sense since he has been doing this job for years. The astounded knight hopes to be as fast as him one day, and she dedicates her entire time to learning the ways of the farmer. Their first day of work surely makes Jin acknowledge that living with this particular female knight might not be too bad after all. All the eggplants are stacked up right next to each other, which is quite the view, but Sarah has no idea what Jin will do with these vegetables now. Explaining that he needs to classify and sort them all before taking them to the market, Jin declares that they can all wait because they're going to have these juicy vegetables for lunch first. They go back to the house where Sarah puts on an apron, while Jin appreciates her for looking good in everything. He tells her that the menu for today is tomato penne with long eggplant and tuna, which is enough to make the tired knight's mouth water with curiosity. She is also ready to help him out, therefore Jin hands her a peeler, asking her to peel four strips off of the de-stemmed eggplants. Sarah has obviously never seen a peeler before, which is why Jin has to give her a tutorial on how to use it before she can get started. The second she uses it though, the adorable knight realizes how convenient it is, while Jin gets back to his own work. A few minutes later, Sarah mentions that he is so good at cooking even though he's a man, but it's really not a big deal for him as he has been living alone his entire life. She also tells him that mostly women cook in her world, while it's considered inhuman for men to enter the kitchen unless they're a chef. 
It strikes Jin that it sounds a lot like how people thought in the early Shawa period, but he puts this thought aside to instruct her in cutting the eggplants diagonally. The female knight is a fast learner, and is about to give this chopping thing a try, but the main problem is that she's holding the knife like a sword. It's not like she's going to war, making Jin guess that she might not have cooked ever before. His comment encourages her to dive into her past, revealing that she belongs to a family of knights where she has only trained her entire life. Cooking was never a top priority for her family, and she hid this fact from him because she didn't want to be chased away from the kitchen. It's clear that she really wants to give cooking a shot, and Jin agrees to teach her what she doesn't know, starting with a chopping lesson. They cook together while Jin also teaches her the basics of cooking, and after some time of hard work, they finally manage to prepare a delicious dish. The tomato penne looks too yummy, and they dig in without even wasting a second. Sarah enjoys the appetizing lunch, complimenting the eggplants that Jin has grown by himself. Jin is glad to hear that the food he grows is worth spending money on by the buyers since this is the first time he has gotten direct feedback from another person. Sometimes a little validation is enough to make someone's day for sure. On the other hand, a girl in the town named Kaho finds out that Jin has married someone from overseas. This rumor spreads like wildfire when all the girls are in town talking about spotting Jin with a blonde woman, which is surely going to create some complications for the farmer. The two girls from town, Maguro and Katori, are on their way to visit Jin in order to find out if the rumors are actually true. They certainly think that it's a great idea to congratulate him for getting married. They finally reach his home, but no one answers the door for a while, which is weird since it's so early in the morning. Meanwhile, Jin shows up to Madame Minori's house to find Sarah fixing up her roof, making the old lady glad that he's here to check on his lovely life. Jin is still extremely confused, therefore he joins her on the roof to get some explanations. It's revealed that Sarah went on her daily walk alone two hours ago because she wanted to gain familiarity as quick as possible. However, she didn't come back, which got Jin worried about her well-being because he had already explained to her the concept of time, and it had surely been too late since she stepped out. He went out to search for her when she came across Minori, who calls him Little Jin, as she has been his neighbor since he was a baby. She informed him that his wife Sarah had come to help them out at her place, shocking Jin who had no idea of her whereabouts. Back to the present, Jin asks Sarah if she really knows how to repair a roof, and she lets him know that Megori's husband Shigeru is the one who taught her just now. Plus, she has received military training as an engineer, so she's naturally good at stuff like this. He also finds out that she never corrected Megori when she assumed that Sarah is his wife, therefore it has become common knowledge now. Jumping to being his wife is a bit too much for poor Jin but Sarah thinks that a weak lie wouldn't have worked for a couple who has known him their entire life. Jin knows that she must be careful about what she tells people, making her sad that he's against people thinking that they're together. Plus, she doesn't have a better excuse for when people ask her why exactly she's living with him, and truth is definitely not an option to consider telling people. The helpless knight just wants to be accepted without complications, and Jin understands her reason as she has obviously put a lot of thought into this lie. He agrees that this idea might actually work, when Sarah mentions that a physical relationship between them is completely out of bounds, because it's a made-up story after all. Her frankness embarrasses Jin, who announces that he is surely not going to make a move on her. This awkward conversation is thankfully interrupted by the older couple, who brings out some sweets for them to enjoy this peaceful evening together. Jin and Sarah finish repairing the roof together, even though Shigeru should really get an actual professional to take a look at it too. The older man offers them some chilled green tea and some sweets, asking them to join them on the porch. Sarah is obviously curious about the bean jelly, and her sweet teacher Jin lists down the ingredients, while she remains fascinated by the black food in front of her. They begin eating, while Sarah actually enjoys the soft texture of the jelly, while Jin is also surprised by the rich sweetness of the dessert. He notices that Sarah has been quiet for quite a while, and looks over to see the loveliest expression on her face as she continues to eat. She keeps complimenting the sweet, gentle taste of the dish, which makes Jin happy to hear such high praise. Her constant compliments catch the older couple's attention as well, who offer more bean jellies and water manju to them, which delights Sarah, and she immediately darts towards the kitchen, even though she doesn't know what a water manja is. It's been a long time since the older couple hosted such an adorable young lady at their place, and Shigeru even congratulates Jin for landing a good wife. Meanwhile, Sarah is surprised to see the jiggling water manja when she gets embarrassed to hear Jin's words of praise for her. He thought it was a good plan, but he's definitely having some second thoughts about the future. Before the older couple can ask them more questions though, the two of them leave for home sweet home. In the meantime, the girls around town are still gossiping about Jin's marriage, actually considering that there might be something fishy going on. It's obvious that they are way too curious about the lonely farmer's life. And we are back with the wonderful harvest of the notorious eggplant. 
which is being focused too much in this manga, but who are we to judge? Jin's shoulders hurt from all the picking of the eggplant containers and now needs help to carry them to the workstation. Sarah offers to lend a hand, but he warns her to be careful since each container is quite heavy. With a bright smile, she tells him that she understood and quite literally starts carrying two containers at a time. Our man Jin is scared for his life, seeing a woman carrying double the amount of weight than him. He is mesmerized by her magical abilities. After asking Sarah about it, he finds out that apparently mana is floating all around in this world, but he just can't see it. And she is increasing her strength by collecting this mana using a mana organ inside of her. Our curious protagonist asks her if he could use this so-called mana as well, but she gives him the dumb look and reminds him that to collect mana, he would need a mana organ, which he sadly doesn't have. Can't argue over this statement, and he tells her how possessing one would have greatly helped him around the manual work on the farm. Sarah finds it amusing over how he has always managed to make everything about farming, as if it's his entire life that revolves around it. Out of nowhere, they both hear a loud bang on the door, and someone starts calling out Jin's name. Sarah gets into her defensive position, but Jin calms her down and tells her he might know who the surprise guest could be. He approaches the door, and right before he could open it, in comes Kaito Oba, his childhood friend. Kaito looks like he has just conquered China, and he blurts out his reasons for coming in unannounced. He wishes to see the super hot foreign wife that Jin has married. This very news has already spread like wildfire all around the town. Before Jin could even put in his own opinion on the matter, a wonderful sweet voice from the kitchen is heard, and it's Sarah putting on an apron and asking Jin if they have a guest over. She lovingly asks him if she should put on some tea as well for hospitality. She sees Kaito and greets him with full confidence. This type of sweetness is out of a bento box for Kaido, who just stands there in shock and disbelief. Jin, the legit farmer boy, just bagged a 10 out of 10. He looks at Jin and confirms if this hot chick is his wife. Sarah, not able to understand the sarcasm in his words, is scared that maybe her acting isn't good enough, and he must have found out. She grabs Jin's arm and rubs her chest against it, telling Kaido that she and Jin are passionate about each other. Jin, in the meantime, tells her that Kaido is being sarcastic and not really meaning that if she is his wife. By this time, Kaido has entered the house, unannounced like her brother, and she stops on her tracks when she gets blessed by the beauty of Sarah. The two hold hands and they've become best friends at once. While Kaido and Sarah discuss various candies, Kaho pulls Jin into the pantry and with a blush on her face, whispers into his ear, asking if Sarah is not wearing a bra. Jin is glad that it's that question and not anything else, but nonetheless, this is an important topic to discuss too. Why isn't Sarah wearing a bra? Kaho is judging Jin so much right now. She can't believe that all men have such an awful fetish that would let their wives roam around brawless. Jin explains to her how this was a complicated situation, and he knew that he had to do something about it sooner or later, but he didn't know a good way to talk about this topic. Kaho suggests that he should take her out for shopping together, but then she takes her words back, because she knows how antisocial and uncomfortable Jin would be if he went undergrounding shop it with Sarah. She then suggests that she would accompany them and save him the hassle of doing the embarrassing things. Jin takes a sigh of relief since now he won't be burdened with such a difficult decision. However, little does he know the plan that Kaho has in mind. She looks at him with innocent eyes and tells him how she had a dress in mind to buy for some time now, and it would be really helpful if he would chip in to buy it for her. He gets her vibe and agrees to buy it for her, and our man is not one bit impressed since he could hear his bank account running dry already. Kaho, now extremely happy, pushes her brother outside the house and tells him that she would be bringing the car to go shopping. Sarah takes a nice shower so she can look pretty before they all leave for shopping. We are utterly grateful to the manga team for blessing our eyes with this masterpiece. Sarah doesn't understand why they're going shopping to buy her clothes since the tracksuit she's wearing of Jin is perfectly fine for her. Despite this thought, she cleans up and wears a tracksuit to go with them. Feeling refreshed with the warm shower, she comes out to see Jin in different clothes, something that he usually doesn't wear. Someone has started blushing too. Kaho arrives with the car and they get ready to depart. She asks Jin over why Sarah carries a sword around with her, but he tells her that it's just a traditional thing and it's not real. Once seated, Kaho offers Sarah some gummies and juice too, which makes her feel overly excited to be treated with such delicacies. She even tells Sarah to wear a seatbelt and helps her wear it, which is when Kaho and Jin both notice that our shiny knight is an F cup. Boy, is Jin super lucky to be calling her his fictitious wife. During their journey, Sarah is mesmerized by the wonderful view of the landscape around them. Jin keeps the windows down as well, which is when he gets to smell her scent, and couldn't help but take a small peek at her. Kaho is right behind him to tell him to keep an eye on the road. She doesn't like the lovey-dovey phase of Jin. They finally arrive at the shopping mall, and Miss Sarah is flustered at the huge shopping complex right in front of her. 
She even looks at the advertising boards and thinks that one of the supermodels is the leader of their village. The innocence of this girl is beyond us. Now the moment we have all been waiting for. It's time to shop for the one item that has been on all of our minds since the moment Kaho said it out loud to Jin. Let's not waste any more time and get started. The trio enter the shopping mall and Sarah can't hold back the excitement that she feels upon entering it. Self-operating doors, so many people walking around, minding their own business, floating star balloons and escalators. All of this is like magic for her. Kaho is a bit surprised by her behavior, but Jin explains how Sarah has never experienced such things in her life, since she is from a very remote countryside area. Kaho may be sharp, but she gets fooled here and leaves to the restroom while Jin pulls Sarah aside and explains to her how he understands her excitement, but they are not alone and Kaho doesn't really know that she's from another world. Sarah gets his drift and agrees to keep a cool head and not overreact whenever she sees something utterly new in the mall. Kaho is back and they make their way to the third floor where the lady section is. They take the escalator, and upon seeing it, Sarah covers her mouth to not cause a commotion about how these flying steps are like a magic carpet from Aladdin. As they make their way to the third floor, almost everyone stares at Sarah because they have not seen such a beautiful and pretty girl in their entire life. Most of them even confuse her for a model. Jin is not impressed by the stares at his so-called wife. By the time they reach the third floor, Sarah looks a bit awkward. She has noticed the stairs and asks Jin why they're continuously looking at her. Kaho chips in and explains how the sword stands out and the tracksuit that only high school boys wear, which makes her all stand out. Looks like she forgot to mention the fact that she's beautiful too. With that said, Kaho with a bright smile tells Sarah that they shall buy loads of trendy clothes to wear and make her look different. She then points to a certain store and tells Sarah that they shall be starting with this store. It is none other than the lingerie store. Our otaku dream is about to come true now. Sarah is flush from head to toe. She has never worn a bra before and seeing all these nude models makes her feel uneasy. Jin, not a fan of this place, tells him that he shall wander around while they do their girly stuff. Sarah looks back at him with frightened eyes and begs him to stay. He agrees to sit on a nearby sofa and wait for them while they do their stuff. This makes Sarah feel better and she enters the store where the professional lady starts by measuring her top and underbust. Jin tries to kill his time by spending it on his smartphone, but he could continuously hear Sarah's confused reactions from inside as the lady continues to make her try on different bras and underwear. When the F cup size doesn't quite fit her right, they then try to make her try on the G cup size. All of this is making Jin very embarrassed. On the other hand, Sarah is going through a life crisis wearing the bras and not understanding how it actually works on her body. All of this is making her feel very awkward as well. The complicated work is complete, and Sarah and Kaho leave the shop with Sarah clutching her chest as if her life depends on it. Jin looks at them and asks if they're done since he did not expect that woman would take this long to shop. Sarah clutches her chest and pushes it up for him to see the bra that she's wearing, telling him how incredible it is and how it helps to hold it in place in a very easy and tight manner. Jin did not want to know that information right now. It seems while trying on the different undergarments, Sarah had a deep and insightful conversation with the shopkeeper who told her the advantages of wearing one. Next up on the list are the casual clothes. Hearing from Sarah, Kaho has come to the conclusion that she needs loads of casual clothes. They enter a budget-friendly store known as Uni Silo from where the girls start collecting different types of clothes to try on. Kaho is in love with Sarah's perfect figure, which makes her look great whenever she tries on something new. Jin is impressed as well by this newfound discovery of women figures. With Sarah's shopping complete, they couldn't leave without the set agreement between Jin and our lovely Kaho. They then enter a very expensive and luxurious shop, which makes Jin feel like he's about to go broke in a couple of minutes. As Kaho ravages through the different items, Sarah's eyes fall on one pretty dress that she really likes. Kaho catches her off guard and makes her try on the pretty dress, despite her protests. Sarah tries it on and comes out of the changing room to show Jin for a few seconds, is speechless at how beautiful it looks on her. Sarah tells him that she is a knight and such clothes are of no need for her, but he is of the opposite opinion since he loves it so much. This is when she realizes how in the past she was mocked by other men to stop wearing knight's armor and training gear since it won't ever get a guy to fall in love with her, but all the dresses never pleased her. Sarah blushes a bit since she has never felt this special for anyone. The girls try out some more clothes and finally Kaho buys herself something nice, making full use of her agreement with Jin. Sarah, however, doesn't buy the dress since she doesn't want to burden Jin any more than she already has. However, Jin produces a bag from behind his back, and it is the dress that she had loved and tried on. Sarah takes it from him and thanks him with tears in her eyes, telling him that she shall cherish this gift forever. Kahu tells her not to say forever and be ready to buy more clothes with his money in the future, since it is her right as a wife. The shopping is done for the clothes, so the trio reach the aisle for food and vegetables. 
Kaho tells Jin and Sarah that she must go fetch some toilet paper and tissues for the other people of the village and she shall join them briefly. Sarah doesn't know much about why she has to do so many errands, to which Jin explains how they are from a low population place and the elderly people have requested Kaho to get them some things from the market and it would be really bad manners if she declined the offer. Jin and Sarah wander into the vegetable section, and boy oh boy are we face to face with the notorious eggplants that Jin grows in his farm. Sarah eyes the long eggplants like they are some type of magical weapon, and excitedly tells Jin that they are the same ones that he grows on his farm. He already knows this since this is all a quick supply chain method. She on the other hand picks up the long alluring eggplants and wants to take them home for god knows what reasons. She congratulates him for being able to supply to so many people and have his eggplants picked rather than any other farms. Boy, this is getting pretty uncomfortable saying that. Kaho has done her share of grocery shopping and is starving. They all go upstairs to the food court and our female knight is taken away by the wonderful aroma that has filled the place. Kaho has already chosen her food and is sitting on a table, busy chowing down on whatever she's gotten her hands on. Now for the complicated part. Sarah must decide what she has to eat, to which Jin suggests she buy something that they cannot cook back at home. And the most obvious choice is Whack Donald's. The franchise suspiciously has a similar name to some other company that we know of. Must have skipped our minds. Nonetheless, Jin hands her the money and watches from afar as she orders the food. At first, it seems easy for Sarah, but when the different offers pile up on her, she is bombarded and can't decide. Luckily, Jin steps in and saves the day. They return back to their seats with Sarah having a big smile because she just ordered her first meal. By this time, Kaho has finished up hers. Jin starts on his chilled udon noodles and slurps up the noodles to which Sarah tells him to not do it since it's bad manners. Kaho pipes in and explains that in Japanese customs, it isn't considered bad manners to do so. Kaho also suggests that she must try the noodles out and that too from Jin's chopsticks. This rings alarm bells in her ears because tasting from the same chopsticks would mean an indirect kiss with Jin. Sarah looks surprised. She tells him that it mustn't be weird since they are husband and wife, and such things must be kept miles away. Jin knows he is in deep trouble because Sarah would not be comfortable with this. Sarah is contemplating the situation and weighing the cause. If she doesn't do it, then the entire plane is foiled, but if she does, then she has indirectly kissed Jin. With her face blushing bright red, internally she reassures herself that this is not a real kiss and is for a good cause. Alas, our female knight has tasted the noodles from Jin's chopsticks, and we get to see her internally scream. After this episode, Sarah could barely taste her own food. After this frightful episode, Sarah has not known what has been happening around her. This indirect kiss took a bigger toll on her delicate heart than she had expected. She could hear Jin calling out her name. She opens her eyes and sees him right in front of her, telling her that they did it. They finally did it. A bit dazed and confused by what that means, she asks what did they possibly do? And that's when Sir Jin creeps in closer to her face and tells her that they just had an indirect kiss. Sarah looks away, blushing from cheek to cheek, clarifying that she only did it to not raise Lady Kaho's suspicions. It seemed like the best possible choice at the time. Jin, a bit embarrassed, takes a slight look and brings out a big plate of udon noodles and brings it closer to her face, telling her that they must do it again properly this time. He brings the chopsticks with the noodles closer to her mouth, his lips easing closer and closer. Sarah screams no and wakes up from what is a bad dream for her. She is feeling grateful that this is all a dream and nothing was real. Jin calls from the other room, worried that she had screamed and if she's fine. Sarah asks if he is the real Jin and not the one who's holding the udon noodles. Vexed at this, Jin tells her to get ready since they must visit Kaho and thank her for helping them the previous day with the shopping. She recalls this and quickly gets up and readies herself to meet Kaho before she leaves for her shop in the morning. She comes out a few minutes later, dressed up in the new clothes that they bought earlier, which makes her look extremely beautiful. They walk to Kaho's place, which is about 15 minutes away on foot. Sarah seems to be enjoying the peaceful village life until she notices something rustling behind her. Quickly, she picks up Jin and jumps into the air with him in her arms. This is the first time a 29-year-old Jin has ever experienced true fear, and this was one of them. They land safely on the ground, and a scared Jin asks what even happened that made her do this. Sarah pulls out her sword and aims at a frog right in front of her, calling it a giant granule, which was a monster that she used to fight back in her world. The frog, not even a few inches in height, is sitting peacefully on the road. Jin bonks her in the head with a karate chop, reminding her that there are no monsters in this world. She calms down until he bends and pokes the frog on its head, making it jump forwards and scaring her out of her life. This makes Jin laugh, and he is later chased by Sarah with her sword for scaring her out of her wits. 
Jin and Sarah make their way to Kaho's sweet shop to thank her for all the efforts that she had made for them in shopping for clothes. They reach the shop, and Kaho is already there with her brother Kaido to greet them. Sarah runs and embraces Kaho with a warm hug, even though the two just met a day ago. Kaho even calls her a pet, since all the stress melts away the moment they embrace. Kaho looks at Sarah and marvels at her wonderful figure, on which the clothes they bought yesterday look absolutely wonderful. Only Sarah could pull off this style with such simple clothes. Sarah also compliments Kaho for being able to look so fabulous in the flowery and cute dress which they had dressed up in at the mall. Sarah thanks Kaho for helping her out and shopping since no one else could have made such efforts and been so patient as well. Kaho invites them inside the sweet shop if they wish to see how it is. Jin has other plans and tries to pull away Sarah, but she gives him the adorable eyes and even throws a small tantrum, wishing to see what a sweet shop looks like. He finally agrees and they enter it. Kaho leaves since she has other matters to attend to while the two are catered to by her brother Kato. Sarah is surprised by the number of sweets inside the store. She inquires from Jin if everything she sees is a type of sweet. He agrees to that fact. However, what is even more important is the fact that most of the sweets are 10 yen, since as per Kaido's words, their prime customers are children. She eyes the candies and has that childish glow in them. Jin sees the shine and produces a 10,000 yen note from his pocket, handing it to her. This is her monthly pay for all the hard work she has done till now. Both Sarah and Kaito's mouths drop wide open. That is a big amount and not everyone can earn this huge in such a short time. Nonetheless, she happily buys a bunch of sweets, and while she does so, Kaito nudges Jin to also get some since it has been a while since she bought them. Jin gives a shy smile and recalls the time when they would buy multiple sweets as a child with his friend Kaito. Once outside, Sarah takes out one of the sweets, which is a gumball type. The packet holds three gumballs, where one of them is the sour one. Kaido suggests that they should play a game where all three of them eat one of the gumballs, and whoever has the sour one must try their best not to show it. The trio chow down on the gumballs, and we can see Jin and Kaido not flinch at all. But when it comes to Sarah, her face is turned red, and she can't seem to chew any longer. The two can easily guess that she has the sour gumball. She made it really obvious with her expressions. Fate works in magical ways, as we can see the girls Alice Hojo, Miguria Chuniso, and Kotori Kawai, who spot Jin playing the game with Kaito and Sarah. All three have heard the rumors of Jin being married to some foreigner, and this is their lucky day since now they have him cornered. Jin tries to escape with Sarah, but the three girls aren't going to let him leave so easily. Do you know what's the worst fear for an introvert, other than to order their own food in a restaurant? It is to be bombarded with questions from a bunch of young teenage girls. This is exactly what has started happening with Jin, who has been attacked by three teenage girls who can't stop asking him about his foreign wife. They absolutely love his wife, and bully her with all sorts of questions, which she can't even answer, since this is the first time she has ever been faced by such teenagers. Jin reminds them that this is a candy store and not a gossip hub. They should take their candies and leave. But these chatty girls aren't going to be distracted that easily, and they tell how they were surprised to know that the shy and isolated Jin just bagged a 10 out of 10. This surprises Jin, since he can't believe that his neighbors Minori and Shigeru just disclosed his so-called fake marriage to the entire village. Old people really can communicate to a whole army in just a matter of seconds. Finding this moment extremely annoying, Jin pulls out his trump card, which is a 500 yen coin. All three girls look at it as if it's some type of gold brick. He hands them the coin and tells them to go buy some candy. This would be their allowance money from him. Well, that is one way to get them to stop yapping and leave his wife in peace. Jin takes a sigh of relief that his bribe worked like a charm. Kaito arrives with two bottles of carbonated soda and hands them to Jin and Sarah, saying it's a treat from him. Jin takes his bottle happily, but Kaito eyes him, telling that he, however, has to pay. That is not fair at all. Sarah checks the bottle from up to down. This isn't like water at all. It's all bubbly and has a different color as well. Jin demonstrates to her about the way to open the bottle. He pushes the opener on the bottle cap, and the marble falls inside the drink, allowing him to taste it. Intrigued, Sarah gives it a try and is very happy when it opens up. She takes a sip of the drink and at once starts coughing, complaining how the drink makes her tongue sting. Jin reassures her that all carbonated drinks taste like this, and over time she shall get used to it as well. Kaito is amused to see that Sarah has never in her life ever tried a drink before. Is she from some type of another planet? Little does he know, that is in fact the truth. She has another sip of the drink, and Jin tells her to not push herself too much. By this time, the three teenage girls are out of the shop with their bag of goodies. This smells like trouble all over again. The three girls crowd around Sarah, and this time they don't push her around, but are actually more nice and friendly. Jin sits up and sits on another bench with Kaido, so he could let the girls mingle with each other. 
Kaido explains how he always gets this nostalgic feeling whenever kids buy the candies from his shop. Jin throws in over how he now understands why Kaido continues running his shop despite having a loss. Kaido corrects his childhood friend, explaining how he manages his other side gigs and this is just a passion of his. It's a pretty expensive passion if you ask us. The boys just sit and vibe with each other when Kaido looks back at him and with a smug grin, he comments on seeing such a big change in his friend. Before, he never would have imagined seeing Jin coming over to his shop, and now he is a completely changed man, all thanks to a certain someone. Jin gives him a slight smile, if only he knew how this change came. One day in July, Jin, Sarah, and Kaido are under the hot sun getting ready to cut down some bamboo shoots. This is also Sarah's first time seeing such a long bamboo. Let's not get our minds dirty with this one. The eggplant has left enough strain as it is. Kaido is fully dressed for the occasion, wearing a mask and goggles to protect himself as he gets ready to chop down the shoots with his trusted saw. Sarah and Jin head the other way and leave Mr. I'll cut all the bamboo shoots myself to get it done. When alone, Sarah asks Jin if they can really use the bamboo shoots to make the thing he called flowing noodles at home. Jin tells her that they can and recalls what happened earlier. They had received a box with Sama noodles. This is a yearly custom that people share with others, where if you keep the noodles in boiling water, they turn long. This is a symbol of love and means to maintain long relationships even with people who you don't often meet. Sarah is amused with Jin's knowledge and how he knows so much about a lot of such things. But out of nowhere, they hear Kaido say that this is such a nice story and would make it so much better with the gift he got them. Both of them scream and scold Kaido for sneaking into the house unannounced. Kaido tells Jin that he is here to pay him back for last year, where Jin had given him his share of noodles because he wasn't able to finish them all by himself. But now, since Sarah is living with him, he can now chow down on so many more noodles. Sarah is horrified herself over the amount of noodles the two of them have to eat if Kaido leaves the noodles with him. But since she hasn't ever tried them before, she agrees to take it, much to Jin's dislike. Which brings us back to the present day, where they are busy cutting the bamboo shoots to make use for the noodles. Sarah begs Jin to allow her to use the sword to help him cut the bamboo shoots down, and he reluctantly agrees after checking left and right to see that Kaido isn't watching. Sarah pulls out her sword, focuses on the bamboo, and takes a deep breath and starts cutting down the bamboo shoots with such skill and grace that it leaves our protagonist Jin feeling like a true maiden in distress. He applauds her performance and is surprised to see the perfect style of cutting the shoots down as well. Kaido arrives and is surprised that they were able to cut four whole shoots in a jiffy. With the items now collected, they reach back and now it's time to start cooking. Sarah eyes the tools placed in front of her. These could in no way be used for cooking. She asks the two men how they plan to use these curl items to make food. Jin and Kaido look at each other and with evil smirks and stares, they mock her if she would be able to keep up. Nothing feels better than to make the best flowing noodles in the middle of July. And that too in the yard of Minori and Shigeru's house. Jin and Kaido are pumped to get started on their noodle cooking. They hold the cruel tools and start acting like savages, which terrifies poor Sarah. They grab the bamboo shoots and start banging and cutting it open. She still has no idea what the two are up to. At this point, Sarah just sits and watches them quietly work. Minori comes over and asks Sarah if the two men are teasing her. She throws a tantrum and begs her to explain what exactly are flowing noodles. Minori tells her to just wait and watch since it will be worth the wait. Not to mention, the two boys are pretty excited to show her how to make these noodles, which is why they're working so hard to get it done. The boys have completed the construction of a bamboo water slide. And yes, this very water slide shall be used to make the noodles flow through. This is by far the most exciting type of dish to eat. The condiments are placed outside and Jin hands Sarah her share of the dipping sauce as well. He then shows her how the noodles shall be placed on the slide and make it flow and she must catch it with chopsticks and eat it. He places the noodles from the mouth of the slide and tells her to get ready, but sadly, Sarah only manages to catch just a few noodles and this makes her feel super sad. Kaido is not shy in this region and can't help but fill himself up with as much flowing noodles as they are coming down the slide. Tears welling up in her eyes, Sarah is not enjoying this game at all. Minori tells Jin to go and teach her how to catch the noodles with the chopsticks. He goes and helps teach her how to hold the chopsticks and with a lot of care and love helps her. Minori makes noodles flow and this time Sarah manages to catch a good helping of it. She then tastes the noodles and at this very moment, nothing matters more than to just enjoy the sun, the cold drinks and the wonderful tasting noodles. Since getting a hang of the noodles just a few seconds ago, she now takes his lunch as some type of a competition and warns everyone that they should be aware of her now since she shall eat all the noodles and leave none for the others. Kaido tells Jin to join them, but looks like he isn't very keen to eat the flowing noodles and instead tells them to get ready as he makes the noodles go down the slide. 
Jin and Sarah have had their fun and games with the flowing noodles and all, but now it's back to working on the farm. The two carry containers to the tomato farm and get ready to plug the tomatoes and pack them up for the market. Jin instructs her to wear gloves since they must be careful. They will pick them up with their hands and cut off the stem to not cause any problems. Even though we don't think there could be any such big problems with cutting tomatoes. Jin looks away for a few seconds and hears Sarah cry out to him. He comes running towards her, alarmed at the sudden frightened scream. What could possibly make the strongest knight scream like this? Jin reaches and finds Sarah telling him that tomatoes should be red, but these are green. She assumes that they have gotten sick and doesn't know what made them sick in the first place. No one looks more pissed than Jin right here. My man is about to throw the biggest telling off ever, but instead he tells her to calm down, explaining how the vegetables aren't sick, but instead are close to ripening. He touches the tomato in a very non-assaulting way and tells her it is time to pluck them. She understands and the two start on the work to pluck them. Sarah babies the tomatoes like they are her children, talking to them in a baby voice and telling them that she shall visit the store and check on them once they've gotten all ripened up. She bends down to pick up another tomato when she finds one of them fully red. She looks back and calls out to Jin to have a look at it. He takes a slight glance and tells her that they can't sell it and would either go to an honesty box or they shall eat it. Sarah delicately holds the tomato and is contemplating the decision to either eat it or keep it in an honesty box. Jin allows her to eat it, but only after they complete the packing of all the containers on the truck. They do that, after which Sarah shows him another red tomato that she was able to pluck, and now both of them can eat together. This is really nice from her, and this is also showing us how the two have started to get closer and closer together. After cleaning the two vegetables, Jin and Sarah walk on top of a hill, and under the sun they enjoy the red tomato together. This feeling is very unique and special, and more importantly, Sarah feels like the tomato tastes extra good today as well. Jin tells her that this feeling and taste can only be experienced if one lives in the countryside. Sarah looks out in the horizon and smiles, a gentle and happy smile. Before, she never realized how hardworking farmers are, but after meeting Jin, she now values all the vegetables and fruits. She wishes that she can see the faces of the people who eat Jin's vegetables and how they feel the joy and happiness while doing so. Jin looks at her with curious eyes. In his heart, he tells himself how he has already seen the happiness and joy in her eyes and face whenever she eats the vegetables or fruit she grows. This feeling is, without a doubt, truly magical. Things are really building up to something super special. This is too much to handle. Let's get back to taking the innocent tomatoes to the shop and selling them off. Sarah feels curious as to how Jin goes about delivering the vegetables, and after a bit of coaxing, he agrees to take her along with him. They reach the agriculture co-op together, which is an agency where farmers sell their goods, and the agency then sells it further to a wider market. Sarah thinks for a few seconds and then comes to the conclusion that it is similar to the guild back at her place that she could take missions and go on adventures to fight demons. She tells Jin that she must meet the guild master and pay her respects to him. He declines her offer, telling her that there is no such thing as a guild master here, and even if there was, what would he be called? A vegetable master? They successfully deliver the vegetables, and on their way back, Jin tells her that they would stop at a supermarket to buy some things for dinner. This is her first time coming to a supermarket, and as always, is glamorized by the huge store. With some ripe tomatoes still at home, he asks Sarah what she would like to eat tonight. This makes her confused since she doesn't know the different dishes of this world, and so just tells Jin that she would eat anything that he cooks. Jin finds this request a bit hard to understand, and explains how every cook wishes to know what the other person wants to eat, so they can later compliment her cooking. Sarah gets to the point, and thus requests Jin if he can make her tomato soup. He agrees, but then she goes further and adds that the soup must have cheese on top too. Now she's just being too specific. Jin starts the shopping of the food items, and he shall be needing to cook the perfect chicken tomato soup and tomato farsies. Once he has collected all the items, he finds Sarah staring very attentively at multiple chocolate boxes. After a careful selection, she legit takes out almost all the chocolates, but is advised by Jin to take only one. After which, she also brings eggs and the two just look like a newly married couple, which is exactly what an elderly woman tells a friend of hers. Jin overhears her and turns bright red from ear to ear. Someone is looking exactly like the tomatoes that he grew on his farm. On the way back, Sarah takes out one chocolate and tries it. The wonderful taste almost makes her cry, and she could feel her body loosening up as well. She offers a piece to Jin, who declines since she is driving, but once he stops at a red light, she feeds him the chocolate with her own hands. This adorable scene is caught by their friends Kaido and Kaho. Talk about the wrong timing. We are back to the humble abode of Jin, and as promised, we see Sarah washing the bright red tomatoes with a smile on her face. 
Jin had agreed to make a tomato-based meal, so Sarah is helping him in cleaning the vegetables up and making his work easier. Since the tomatoes have been all washed up, next comes the smashing of the tomatoes, which really gives Sarah a heart attack. The horror on her face makes it look like Fia has asked her to kill someone that is very dear to her. She questions his sanity. Why would he ask her to mash up the very things that she has taken so good care in bringing up? The tomatoes are not babies, Sarah. Nonetheless, he reassures her that it isn't something that horrific and simply the way things are done here. He asks her to cut the tomatoes and then mash them up so the work is done easily. With the chicken, onions, and the notorious tomatoes all mixed up, he keeps it in a frying pan and starts cooking. Our eyes are also blessed with the image of Sarah in an adorable apron that has a cute cat on it. Jin is also actually enjoying this moment where for once he isn't cooking alone and something feels different this time as well. He stares at Sarah from time to time and her face looks adorable and her presence in the kitchen is what changed the entire vibe. He feels happy and is enjoying these little moments. Now comes the time to make the farces, which he gives Sarah the responsibility of kneading the bread and he himself gets the rest of the food on its final stages. Dinner is served. Now let's explain what we have on the table in a MasterChef style. Tonight, we shall be eating chicken tomato stew and tomato farces, which has been cooked by none other than Sarah and Jin, who are not yet dating, but it seems like they could start. Sarah is delighted to see the items on the table and holds herself back from munching it all down by herself. She gives her grace for the food, the way a Japanese person does and starts with the stew. The first bite sends her to seventh heaven. Her cheeks turn with delight and her eyes also start to water. Sarah comments on how the acidity of the tomato is perfect for the hot seasons. With the taste of the tomato still in her mouth, she grabs one of the breads and munches it with it. The different emotions Sarah is going through right now is what only a true food lover could relate to. Her hands have their own mind, as they rage over the table and grab whatever it can hold and toss it right into her mouth. Jin is done for the day and takes a deep breath. He tells Sarah that he can't eat anymore, but upon glancing back at her, he sees she isn't paying much attention because her hunger hasn't died down yet. Someone stop this girl. He asks if she isn't forcing herself to eat all the food and to leave some of it as leftovers for the next day. She looks back at him and with a questionable look on her face, she tells him that in the beginning she was, but now she's just enjoying the flavors. She hasn't ever tried something this good in her world yet. She tells him if he's done for the night, then he mustn't worry, since now the rest is all hers for the taking, and there she goes again with the eating, as her hands take up another bread and the other takes a spoon to taste the red tomato. Jin eyes her eating habits, and with an alarmed tone, asks if she isn't using some sort of magic where her stomach expands and she's able to store it all in. With a full mouth, Sarah asks, what does he even mean? This foodie side of Sarah was on another level, and we hope we don't see more of this. Her perfect figure could turn upside down. But who are we to judge, right? Morning has awakened the female knight, and she washes her face with water. We get to see her wear adorable teddy bear clips to keep her hair back. Sarah calls these clips useless, cute, and useless. Well, that's a mean dig to one side. She is about to leave the washroom when her eyes fall upon a weighing scale. This is not about to end well. Sarah comes out and is happy to see Jin cook up something really appetizing for breakfast as well. She asks him what the weighing machine is with a bright shine in her eyes. He tells her to get on top of it, and as soon as she does this, the machine displays some type of number, and he tells her that that is her weight. Jin gets closer to take a look, and he reads out the number 60, but couldn't continue further because Sarah puts him in a headlock, telling him not to continue any further, otherwise there would be dire consequences. The cracking of his neck could be heard as well. She tells him that she may not be much of a maiden, but she is still a bit of one, and his actions just cross the line. Jin begs her to let go of his neck. She does so, and he nurses his neck with a tender hand. A few seconds more, and he would have seen Jin's head rolling somewhere on the floor. Feeling a bit better, Jin tells her that this tool is great for keeping in shape. He looks at Sarah and asks, a bit worried, if since coming to this world, she has felt changes in her body. Defending herself, Sarah tries to explain how it isn't her fault that the food of this world is just too good to be true. His cooking, Madame Minori, Shur Shigeru, and Sir Kaito are all to be blamed for her weight gain, since they are the ones who introduced her to all these wonderful delicacies, which are becoming increasingly difficult to avoid. Jin takes charge and tells her that the only solution would be for her to lessen her food intake, starting off with sugar and extra meals during the night. Sarah throws a huge tantrum over this and doesn't wish to let go of the one thing she has enjoyed the most in this world. She gives the option that she can always exercise and practice with her sword. This gives him an idea, and he takes her with him to a mountain that is part of his private property. And this makes her really happy, as she gets out of the car in her knight armor and is amazed by how big the mountain is, and is also relieved that she can train here easily. Owning a mountain is no small thing, and this is what Sarah is surprised about. She asks Jin if he isn't some type of aristocrat. 
but he tells her that sadly he isn't, and that they are in the countryside, so to own one isn't that unique. She asks him to tell her how far his mountain ends so she can train freely. He tells her the area that belongs to him where she can train easily and no one would bother her. Sarah turns around and looks at him with her adorable eyes, pointing at her sword as well, waiting for his signal. He shakes his head in affirmation that she can go ahead and start training. It seems as if he's some strict owner who has kept a leash on his pet. He asks if she has to wear the armor since it is mighty hot and moving around in that thing would be a really tiring and sweaty. She tells him that training in the armor would yield better results than without it. Plus, she also feels more of herself when she wears it. Sarah pulls out her sword from the sheath and the look in her eyes completely changes. She doesn't look like she's Sarah anymore. The same girl would go through a whirlpool of emotions over everything since now she looks more composed, focused, and determined. For Jin, Sarah is looking like a true female knight from another world. All this is only possible after she holds her trusted sword in hand. Sarah is trying her best to not look at Jin, but his eyes on her can be felt and she asks if he will be watching her train this entire time. He apologizes and tells her that he was just curious to see how a knight's sword swings like since this is his first time watching such a spectacle. She is a bit hesitant, but she agrees to have him stay and watch her. She then starts with her swings and Jin is just amazed at her form, the way she confidently swings the sword and knows what she's doing. Her years of training are all evident right now to him and it makes him realize that she wasn't bluffing at all when she said that she is a knight from another world. He tells her that she can freely practice as long as she wants while he goes and rests in his car. A few hours later, he hears a knock on his windshield and sees Sarah sweating from toe to toe and with a bright smile on her face as well. Seeing how satisfied she is, Jin feels happy that he was able to bring her to the mountain. They head home now and while they ride back, he looks at Sarah and is flushed when he could see her bra through her shirt. He quickly looks away and tells her to wear a jersey on top, but she doesn't notice until she looks down and is very embarrassed. She quickly wears the jersey and apologizes. They reach home and Jin tells her to shower while he cooks dinner. She throws a small fit that she also wants to cook with him, but he knows by the time she gets free from the shower, the dinner would be ready. This is the first time after a while that he has cooked dinner all alone. While Sarah soaks herself in the warm bath, Jin is getting the dinner ready. He stands in the kitchen and slowly takes out all the items to cook and feels a bit awkward. Sarah isn't there and he has started to feel very unbothered. He feels free and as if he could do anything at this moment. Jin starts to multitask as he cooks up the noodles, the vegetables, and much, much more. He has a smile on his face as well, since he's able to do so much at such a small time. His inner voice kicks in and thinks to himself how everything is proceeding very smoothly all alone. When he cooks with Sarah, he recalls how there is a literal tornado of emotions inside the kitchen. He remembers how Sarah started crying when she mixed the salt with the sugar and at another time when she kept the eggs in the microwave to boil, which pretty much resulted in the microwave bursting. And then there was this time when he was teaching her how to cut onions and she kept crying and asked her how he was able to do it without crying. We learn to see that Jin is the composed one in the situation, whereas Sarah is always being worried. But the kitchen does seem pretty lonely without her looks like someone is getting a bit too attached to the female knight. Jin is all annoyed at himself now. What the hell just passed through his mind and he increases his work pace so that all these unnecessary thoughts are discarded from his mind. He turns back to ask Sarah to get him the salt, but there's no one standing there and he goes to take the salt out himself and realizes that maybe he is taking Sarah for granted. By this time, Sarah has come out of the bath and is smelling pretty good. We would definitely love to get a sniff too. Jin tells her that dinner is ready and he shows her the fried tomato with cheese on top. She starts drooling, seeing the food, and just wants to get started. Sarah helps with taking the plates to the table, promising that she shall be careful and won't break the plates this time. Jin smiles. He was right. Without Sarah, the kitchen is more peaceful, but at the same time, more lonely. She starts off with the noodles, and Jin notices that she has gotten pretty good at using them. After finishing her first dish, she holds up her plate as a sign for second helpings, but Jin tells her that they are on a strict diet to stop her from getting fat. The realization that she may have to cut down her eating habits hits her hard, and Sarah takes a few minutes to accept this harsh reality. Jin can't take this anymore and gets up to cook more noodles for her. Sarah promises to train 10 times harder as well and lose the extra weight. A few days later, she tests the weight machine again, and well, if you know it, her weight has actually increased instead of falling down. Something has to be done now. We have had our fair share of fun and games, and now it's time to work on the farm. Under the scorching heat, Jin is busy pulling out weeds from the ground. These weeds have to be handpicked and it's starting to break his back. He looks over and sees Sarah completely involved in pulling out the weeds, which is very fascinating to him. He shakes his head and gets back to work. However, while working, he could hear some children speaking. Annoyed that children have come to ruin his peace, he gets back and quietly looks from behind the tent at who is even here. 
It is three girls, Alice, Katori, and Maguri, the ones he had met back at the candy shop and paid for them to get candy and leave him and his fake wife alone. He stands up, towering over them while they are busy arguing with each other. It seems Maguri is busy instructing the other two girls of her well-detailed plan to surprise Jin and tell him that they are now here to hang out. But Jin is way ahead of them and asks in an angry voice what they're even doing. This makes the girls scream in fright and tell him not to scare them. Maguri tells him that they are actually here to surprise him. Now what kind of a surprise would that be? Oh, of course, it's the type where the girls wish to hang out with him. Jin isn't too happy to see them and tells them to go home, but Maguri starts whining and complaining of how they're bored at home. Katori pitches in and explains how Jin looks very busy with work and they are in the wrong going unannounced. Jin appreciated her by saying that the oldest girl has a point. This makes Katori stop and just feel different emotions. She can't believe that Jin just called her the oldest. Maguri laughs and corrects Jin by saying that she is the oldest, whereas Katori is younger than her. Jin looks from left to right at both of the girls and then points back to Katori saying that she's not only much bigger, but much more mature than her. Nonetheless, while Katori is busy trying to process the fact that she looks older than her friends, Maguri questions Jin why he keeps calling them as this girl and you. They have decent names, so he should use them. Perplexed, Jin plainly tells him that he doesn't know their names. This makes all three girls gasp in surprise. How can the one person they love bothering so much not know their names until now? Jin continues by saying he has seen the girls and waves back at them numerous times in the past, but has never gotten the chance to know them. In comes Sarah and the trio are all over her. She really has a fan favorite here. She's happy to see them since the last time they met was at the candy shop. The girls complain to her over how she remembers their names and not Mr. Jin. Not in the mood to have a whole debate with them, he asks them to introduce themselves. And so we get the perfect introduction. Maguri Ichinose is a 13-year-old middle school girl, and then comes Katori Kawai, who is actually 12 years old, and finally comes Alice Hojo, who is the youngest and is 10 years old. My oh my, we have some really young children on our hands. The girls beg Jin to allow Sarah to play with them, but he tells them that they have some weeds to pick and the work isn't finished. The girls then suggest that they can help, and together they can do the work faster. Jin tells them that he is very strict when it comes to his farm, so if they wish to help, they can't complain and have to give it their all. All three girls are pumped up now and ready to get started. The weeds have been picked and now we can finally have some time with the three girls. Sarah thanks the girls for helping her set everything up so quickly since now they can enjoy it together. Sarah helps Jin carry the bags and tells him that she was really looking forward to playing with the girls and she would work extra hard in the future to make it all up. Jin asks Maguri what she had planned to do today and she tells him that she still has to decide since this isn't the city and they are in the countryside. She is awfully annoying, but at the same time correct in what she has said. Katori asks Sarah what she would like to do, and after a bit of thinking, Sarah tells the girls that since this is her first time coming to the village, she would like to visit the places that they like the most. That way, she will also get a good understanding of the places around her. Maguri jumps in excitement, telling everyone that she knows the perfect place to take her, but Alice, who is the quiet one, tells her that the place she has in mind is very far away, and they can go there at the very end. And so, Alice leads the way and shows Sarah a canal that she really likes. Jin and the other two girls aren't that impressed, whereas Sarah is over the moon seeing the wonderful canal and the creatures that live near it. She does get scared when she sees a frog, but not that much since Jin has already had his fair share of laughs in the past with her. Katori wishes to take Sarah to the residential district and show her a bunch of stray cats that just sit around being lazy. While the girls play around with the cats, Sarah is awfully quiet, and she leans in and in a whisper asks Jin what these adorable creatures are. He tells her that they are cats, pretty straightforward from him. She begs him if she can take one home, but he disagrees since caring for these animals is tiring. The cats also surround him all at once and everyone can't help but laugh, commenting that Jin might have some type of secret gift or magic spell to make them come to him. On a warm sunny day, Sarah runs up to Jin and the teen girls with a plastic bag full of refreshing drinks. She offers them the beverages and apologizes for being late as she was preoccupied by the cuteness of the cats. Jin is so done and stares blankly at Sari. That is when Katori brought them to a territory full of adorable cats. Sarah sat down with the cats and Maguri sighed knowing that she won't be getting away anytime soon. And that is how Sarah ended up spending an entire hour with the cats. She keeps apologizing, but the three girls are good at reassuring her. It was Sarah's first time seeing cats, so the excitement is totally understandable. Plus, she brought drinks too, so it's a win-win. Time with cute cats traded for some refreshing juice. 
At last, it is Maguri's turn to show Sarah her favorite spot. She is curious, but Maguri is not going to reveal the destination anytime soon. The group passes through a heavy dark forest, and after stepping over many obstacles, Maguri finally reveals her spot. It is a secret base in the depths of the jungle. The house looks like a dream from the inside. It looks super cozy with the perfect amount of sunshine and all the things needed for a good time. There are books, snacks, and soft sofas. What else could a human possibly ask for? As expected, Sarah is completely mesmerized by the place and immediately asks Maguri to explain her secret base. With an evil smile, she informs that this is the place they use to hide from the bad guys, which are the adults. Sarah is extremely shocked because in her view, this must be a military base used to hide from attacks. And Maguri is having the time of her life spreading misinformation. According to her, a military base and attacks sound cool, so yes, this is a military base now. Jin is yet again done with Maguru's mischievous antics, but he is also in wonder of the secret base. Sarah wants to know if Jin played here too in his childhood. Jin's eyes sparkle with a memory of his childhood. The base was much smaller and run down when he and Kaito used to play there. It was basically them playing and Kaito trying to defend himself from the mice. The teens realize that the place has been around for way longer than they thought. Sarah is completely lost, but Jin comes to the rescue to describe the concept of a secret base. The kids living in this area have always been using this place to hang out away from the prying eyes of the adults. That being said, the adults used to hang out there in the past too, so basically everyone knows the location of the spot. The place has been passed down for generations, and the kids are responsible for maintaining it. Sarah begins exploring, and she uncovers an embarrassing childhood memory of Jin and Kaito. They scribbled on the wall about becoming strong enough to defeat the evil forces of the entire world. Jin turns red and tries to destroy the scribbles, but Sarah stops him. She also discovers a bunch of sticks lying on the corner. Maguru lets her know that they have been collected from the forest and they are used to play Chambara. It's a game where they pretend that the sticks are swords and fight each other. Sarah's eyes glow at the mention of their swords. The girls immediately bombard Sarah with questions about her imitation sword. Maguri wants to see some moves, but unfortunately, the sword is not something Sarah can unsheath on her own will. The teens are fangirling over Sarah as she talks about a nice dignity or something. It's time for a match outside the military base. It's Maguri versus Sarah, and even though it's just a stick match, Maguru feels low-key nervous because Sarah's night energy doesn't lie. Even though Maguri, Katori, and Alice try their best to defeat Sarah, she proves way too strong. They all lie on the floor, tired and drained. And now it's Jin's turn to face Sarah, but surprise, surprise, he proves weak as well. The sun is shining brightly over the small town, and the summer insects are buzzing around. Jin opens the windows and doors to improve ventilation, but it isn't helping much on this sultry day. Sarah is sweating profusely, with her face red as she sits in front of the electric fan. Its magical powers aren't helping her because she feels like melting. Jin quickly glances at the air conditioner that he hasn't cleaned in a while, and unfortunately, he cannot turn it on. The duo has to work in the fields later, so if they do not cool down now, they might suffer a heat stroke later. The fan isn't helping much, but Sarah is still enjoying the air. Jin thinks that it's time to bring out the secret weapon, an ice shaving machine with delicious syrups alongside. Just like every other time, Sarah is impressed and quickly asks the machine's purpose. Jin introduces her to the classic summer treat that is shaved ice lathered in syrup. The excitement is too much for Sarah. That is when Jin asks if she didn't have access to anything like shaved ice in her precious world. Well, back there, ice was too precious and present only in cold areas or created by mages. It wasn't as common as it is here. Jin teaches Sarah how to use the machine. First, you put ice in the container above and put a bowl beneath. Then by turning the handle, magic happens. Sarah is nervous as she slowly touches the handle. Crunching sounds start coming out of the machine and the ice is being crushed cleanly. The ice is extravagant and Sarah is beaming with happiness as she fills her bowl quickly. Now it's Jin's turn, but his arms aren't as strong as Sarah's. It takes a bit of strength and time for him to shave ice and Sarah quickly reminds him that he cannot catch up doing manual labor in fields either. Jin is super embarrassed, but Sarah goes on. She tells Jin that all her powers were used for wars in the previous world. Blood was washed with more blood, but the people in this world use their abilities to enrich their lives. They are creating things that add to the joy in the day-to-day -day life. Sarah believes that this world is a place filled with happiness, and maybe she's right. The pretty shaved ice cream is ready. The fan is set, and the sun is still shining. The duo sits on the porch and looks over the valleys. It's finally time for the taste test, and as expected, Sarah finds the sweet treat outrageously delicious. She could easily gobble 10 bowls of it. As Sarah begins chowing down on the shaved ice, she experiences a brain freeze. She holds her head and begins panicking. 
Is she going to die? Jin, with a straight face, confirms that she doesn't have long left. Three hours at maximum. Sarah begins losing her mind, but Jin quickly tells her that he's lying. It is common to experience headaches when eating shaved ice quickly. Sarah, still in shock, doesn't hesitate before launching an attack on Jin. Violence is against the rules, but he deserves it. But wait, something pleasant happens. The wind has started blowing and Sarah finally feels cooler now. The wind sways her beautiful hair as her cheeks are blushed and Jin is in awe. That is when she notices that Jin's mouth is red. Jin explains the coloring from the syrup and Sarah sticks her tongue out to show him the color. Jin blushes at the sight and Sarah is quick to notice. However, the moment of peace is over as the three girls spot the unofficial couple having shaved ice. Sarah is excited and Jin is of course disappointed as his peace and moment of romance is over. He leaves to make shaved ice and asks the girl to choose between strawberry and melon as they are the only two flavors left. But Maguri is upset because all she wanted was a wasabi flavor. The girl's tastes are indeed questionable. The three girls, Alice, Katori, and Maguri, are over at the house of their unofficial parents yet again. They have come over with their pencil pouches and notebooks, but all they're doing is eating shaved ice. The girls are showing each other their tongues when Jin shows up. Maguri asks him to see the colors, but Jin bursts out. He is frustrated at the girls staying over all day, every day. He asks them to hang out at their own places. Maguri begins whining because her parents will nag her to study, clean the house, or help with work. She's as relatable as it can get. Jin continues nagging, but the girls cannot help it, especially since Sarah is around. Jin has his moment of silence as he thinks about Sarah and her warm nature. She has filled up his empty life. However, he quickly turns his attention to the girls' homework. Maguri has barely started her summer homework. Jin advises looking up to Katori, who seems like the type to have finished her homework now. But it is Maguri's time to shine as she reveals that Katori hasn't even touched her homework. But the girls feel betrayed as Alice reveals that she had completed her homework a while ago. Jin appreciates her and pats her on the head as she blushes. She asks Maguri and Katori about the kind of summer homework, which sounds extremely boring, except the astronomical observation. The sky observation and movement of celestial bodies amazes Sarah. She mentions the eyesight limitations, but Jin mentions the existence of telescopes and binoculars. Sarah expresses her wish to do astronomical observations, and the girls, of course, don't miss as Katori comes up with an offer. They can group up and do the astronomical observation tonight, but Jin gives them a reality check. Observations are seen on mountains, and the girls won't be permitted by their parents. But he falls into his own trap as the girls convince him to come along for male adult supervision, alongside Kaito. It's gonna be a blast. The girls go back to take permission and gather again at nighttime. Kaido shows up with a big car and everyone hops in. He describes the viewing platform they are headed to. He used to visit it with Jin in the past and apparently it makes the sky look really pretty. Sarah is excited as she looks out of the window while Jin looks at her with a smile and eyes full of adoration. They reach their destination in the depths of the valley with stairs leading up. The group climbs the stairs as they move towards the viewpoint. Maguru is only interested in shining her flashlight at Jin's butt, while Sarah is pointing it straight to her face like a ghost. The trip is utter chaos already. With no artificial lighting around, the sky looks extra amazing tonight. The group looks up and tries to take in the beauty with Sarah only being able to mouth a wow. Countless shimmering stars illuminate the dark sky, forming intricate patterns. Each star seems to tell a story, inviting contemplation beneath the vast, mysterious beauty of the night sky. Jin, the logical one, or maybe the party pooper, reminds the girls of their homework. Maguri and Katori begin the great observation. Maguri pulls out a map, but not being the intelligent student that she thought she was, she doesn't understand a single thing. She asks Jin for some help, and he denies in a split second. On the other hand, Kaido has set up the huge telescope that he had because of his dad's hobbies. He offers Sarah a look as he has lined up all the telescopes with the moon. Sarah takes a look at the gorgeous surface of the moon. Maguri asks for help once again, and this time it's Kaido who gladly goes over to help. Sarah is amazed at the moon and the telescope's incredibility, and Jin is amazed at her amazement. Does that make sense? Well, at least for Jin, it does. Jin takes a look too and asks Sarah about the sky back home. She says that the moon looked similar to this one, but there were many instead of one. Some were pink, while others were red, and Jin seems a little weirded out by this piece of info, but that's alright. Sarah mentions the sky's looks, and her companions gazing at the night sky. Jin realizes that it's been long since she talked about her home, and suddenly a realization of Sarah leaving hits him. It makes him a little sad. Human relationships are a pain in the butt, which is why the boy moved to his town. But then, Sarah brought him to life again, and he got used to her unconsciously. 
Jin is unconsciously staring into Sarah's eyes and slowly moves closer to her. Sarah's face turns into a tomato as Jin leans in. And surprise, Maguri is back as she is done with her homework and she wants to have snacks now. Jin's romantic moment flops yet again as everyone gathers at the table to have snacks. Jin sadly realizes that the relationship he has with Sarah means nothing. On their way back home, Sarah and Jin are out of the car as they are walking back home while Kaido drops off the kids. Kaido is a bit concerned while the girls bid Sarah farewell with tired tones and tearful eyes. Before driving off, Kaito asks Jin if he wants to go to the summer festival as a group. Jin is confused at first, but the confusion wears off as he sees a smiley Sarah getting excited. A festival with fireworks is all she needs, and Kaido promises that it will be a blast. Jin mentions that he's not good with crowds, but Kaido thinks that everything is alright. What matters is that Jin is willing to attend just like the old days. It's true that marriage really changes people, and all that Jin responds with is an eye roll. He asks Kaido to stop being gross and shoves him away. The duo gets going as Sarah turns on the flashlight. It is a lot dimmer than before, and Sarah worries that she has broken it. Jin reassures and tells her about batteries and how they work. He turns on the flashlight from his phone, but Sarah is low-key disappointed as the light is pretty dim. The duo is still 10 minutes from home and the small town is not well lit at all. Sarah asks Jin to stop and offers a suggestion. Sarah can create light using magic and asks Jin for permission. She can create light, which is far more than the flashlight, which is necessary because they can get hurt by tripping or getting bit by a snake. Jin permits her but asks her to be inconspicuous. Sarah looks like a fairy as her hair begins floating as she moves both her hands around. She is creating magical balls with countless strings of light surrounding her. Sarah utters words in an unknown language and creates an absolutely ethereal scene with countless little light balls. Jin is amazed, and Sarah explains the creation process of the beautiful ball in her hands. She offers to hand it over to Jin. Jin cups his hands just like Sarah, and she hands over the ball holding his hands delicately. The duo stand face to face with the ball of light in between them. Sarah realizes that she's holding Jin's hand and quickly tries to back off while panicking. However, Jin holds onto her wrist and pulls her closer. Sarah's heart does somersaults as she is now inches away from the boy's face. They hear the leaves rustling in the background as they hear someone coming. It is Shigeru from the town who runs away in horror thinking that he has seen a will-o'-wisp. All this time, Sarah's face has been on fire as she informs Jin about his hand intertwined with hers. Jin backs off in a second and apologizes. It's just that Sarah was surprised at him pulling her into the trees, but now that she has realized it was because of Shigeru, she has calmed down. They head for home quickly as it is very, very late now. The next day, Kaho visits and narrates Shigeru's fearful story. Kaho jokes about a couple flirting in the dark while eating her shaved ice. However, the actual reason she has come over is the summer festival. She is here to give Sarah a gorgeous yukata. Amid the warm embrace of a summer evening, a festive atmosphere comes alive at the summer festival. Maguri and Alice arrive with Kaito early at four and the place is packed. Traditional paper lanterns illuminate the scene, casting a soft, colorful glow upon the lively crowd. People are adorned in vibrant yukatas, adding a touch of elegance to the gathering. The air is filled with the aroma of sizzling foods coming from numerous food stalls lining the festival grounds. Takoyaki grills sizzle as vendors skillfully flip the octopus-filled batter balls. All kinds of savory fragrances fill the air. The group is searching for Sarah and Jin, but wait no more as the main characters have arrived. All the men turn in awe to look at the beautiful woman who has just arrived. They assume that she might be a model because her beauty is impeccable. Sarah nearly trips while greeting her friends excitedly, but her man is there to hold her. Jin asks her to be careful and Sarah blushes while apologizing worriedly. Maguri asks Sarah if she's okay and Sarah assures them by saying that it's just her shoes called Geta. It is traditional Japanese footwear made of wood, so yeah, it is indeed hard to walk on. The girls shower the true beauty with compliments who were nervous about wearing a yukata for the first time. She compliments them in return too. Jin is smiling at his wife, and Kaito is just seething with jealousy. How dare he get such a gorgeous wife when his friend doesn't even have a girlfriend? Jin tries to comfort him by saying that he will meet someone eventually, but that doesn't work. Kaito also got a full report from Kaho about Jin seeing Sarah in a yukata for the first time. His brain short-circuited and just stared at her in shock. This is all pretty new for Kaito, who assumed his friend to be a robot, but nah, he just doesn't have any emotions. Jin Loki wants to curse Kaho because Kaito is going crazy. He is jealous and wants to find himself a girl in this festival ASAP. Jin ignores him, assuming he is emotionally unstable. Then he takes a look at Sarah, who looks beautiful as always. Jin admits that he feels things when he looks at her because it is impossible not to. 
but little does he know, Sarah also feels the same emotions while she stares at his back unaware. That is when mischievous Maguru enters the scene to shake everyone out of their thoughts. It's time to try the delicious food. Sarah has a mental list of yakisoba, takoyaki, fried squid, hot dogs, candies, cakes, and whatnot. The group begins trying the foods one by one, and everyone enjoys themselves. The festival is all about love and warmth. Alice stands by John and thanks him for his presence at the festival while the other girls try food. Jin is reminded of all the ways he has been coming towards living life recently, but in his opinion, it's all thanks to Sarah. She has filled his lonely and empty world with warmth and amusement. 